All right. So we are going to be talking about a lot of topics today. In we're, we're leading up to trigonometric equation solving, but it all kind of goes hand in hand. So today we're just going to be simplifying trig expressions. One of the major parts that kids struggle with in this section is knowing when you're done. Because you might go through some trades and go, well, I think I'm done. And the only way you know you're done is because you're going to look at the answer key, which only has the answer on it. Um, and then say, oh, I guess I'm not done. Or in some people's cases, oh, I had that like two steps ago, and then for some reason I kept going. So you, it is tricky. The ones on the test are pretty basic in nature. Like, I'm not going to have you do 17 different trades. It's not going to be like that. Um, so on your formula sheet, which is like salmon in color, I think. The one you use on the test is blue, but it's the same one. The side that says trigonometric identities, that's the one that you're going to have access to. What I'm going to show you on some slides are some bonus level trigonometric identities. It's just the ones that you have that are rearranged. So I think at some point we're going to, I mean, the slides will be up, but you can um, maybe also look forward to us posting a PDF of those, of those rearrangements in case you're stuck on your homework and you need to look at some things. But what I really need you to rely on today are just your basic algebra skills. So a couple notation things. First of all, I think you know this from your trig experience, but they're always looking for shortcuts when they're writing trig, especially when you think about how these work. There's a lot of things you got to write down on simplifying and verifying. So instead of the function sine theta being squared written like this, they go ahead and write it as sine squared theta. So that way there's no confusion as to who's being squared. It's the function being squared, not the theta. So we're going to take that same approach, and I'm just as guilty of you guys as this next thing, but sometimes as we're doing verifying and simplifying, you'll catch me like writing down sine and cosine with no variables, and that's naughty. You should not do that. It's actually like gibberish. If you just write down sine and there's no, nothing in the sine function, that doesn't mean anything. So try not to do that. I know that's a pet peeve of our calculus teacher, so sine theta, sine x, whatever you're working with. Um... All right, let's talk about this. This, I think there's space on your notes to write this out. Maybe, maybe not. Or not, just watch. Okay, so let's talk about this. This is called the, the major Pythagorean identity, and it has to do with, if you think about your unit circle triangle, the radius is one, and I know that the cosine is the horizontal leg and the sine is the vertical leg. So if you set this up as a Pythagorean theorem question, it gives you the equation sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. But turns out that there's two supplementary Pythagorean theorem formulas that you can derive. I go ahead, I give them to you. They're on this page. Do you see them? They're like second line down on the trig identities part of the formula sheet. But in calculus and on standardized testing, you won't be given these. So maybe you'll have to derive them. And even to this day, guys, I've been doing these problems for a lot of years. And I still have to stop and think about, okay, which one is it? Because I have a really bad memory and I'm dyslexic. So what you can do is you can take the original Pythagorean identity, which everyone knows and loves, and if you go through and you divide by, first let's do the sine squared function. So if you divide every term here by sine squared, let's talk about what we still have. So right here, what would happen if you took sine squared and divided by another sine squared? They'd cancel to a 1. And then a plus sign... Cosine squared divided by sine squared. Well, forget the squares for a minute. Just what's cosine over sine? Cotangent. So if you square both of the functions, now it's cotangent squared. And then 1 over sine is really cosecant. So if I square it, then you have cosecant squared. So what we just wrote down, it's a little bit of a variation. Whoops. It's a variation of this guy right here. I didn't mean to move that. Oh, Derek. There we go. So they rearranged the addition problem, but it's the same formula. So again, there might be a time in your life, and there will be if you're moving on to calculus, where you are not given those theorems, um, and you have to know them. So here we divided by sine squared. What do you suppose we're going to do over here? Let's try dividing by cosine squared. See what happens. All right. So I heard this is tangent squared and then cosine squared over cosine squared is a 1 and then 1 over cosine squared is secant squared so you get literally that identity right there and then this is I think the part 
that kind of confuses kids. They're like, okay, well, that's an identity, but like, how does that help me when I do my trig trading? I think we need to go back to our roots, guys. An equation is a set of two things that are equal to each other. That's all it is. So this is the slide. There's no worksheet 30 for you guys. You didn't get this worksheet in the last chapter four stuff, but we're going to hopefully post this as a PDF. This is the slide that shows you your manipulation of all the identities and how you can use them. So like for instance, this is the true identity, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, but how did they manipulate it to get to this version of it? See what they did? They just subtracted cosine squared over. So that's an algebraic manipulation that I expect you to be able to do in your head, but then the problem is, okay, well, how do I use it? So in your math today, if you end up with this on your paper, one minus cosine squared, you should be able to swap it out for what? It's equal to sine squared. That's how equations work in trig trades, right? One side of the equation is equivalent to the other side, so you can trade them for each other. The art is when do you trade and when don't you trade. So this is where like the tool belt comes in, guys. I'm going to give you a list coming up on a slide here of things that you can try. And a lot of it just comes down to like your general natural ability to do math. The good news is you guys got this far in math because you're very good at math, which means, yeah, <laughs> which means that you have very strong algebra instincts. Like, if I just throw a problem at you, you're going to be like, I don't know, but I feel like I should distribute. And that's probably the right answer, which is neat. So, here we go. This, ignore that for a minute. Um, we're going to come back to that. Hey, I skipped it. Where'd it go? Back up, back up. Time out. I have a slide. I'm going to find it. It's a slide where it sh shows, like, things to try, things to try. I bet it's at the, all, right, all the trig trades on the next side of the worksheet. Yeah, okay. Never mind. It's coming up later. All right, we'll talk about that next slide I'm looking for. It comes up later in the video. All right, first, I want to bring back an old topic. Um, but I want to show you how you could use trigonometric identities to solve them. And then we'll have a quick powwow about how maybe that's not the coolest way to do the question. But I just want to throw it out at you. Okay, so this is not a new question. If I said the sine, oh boy, the sine, this guy right here, the sine of theta is 3 over 5, and then theta is between 0 and 90, so we're in the first quadrant, find the tangent of theta. So up until today, you guys would have been like, awesome, draw yourself a little triangle, it's in the first quadrant, and if sine is 3 over 5, Sine is, remember, y vertical over r, the hypotenuse. So this is 3, this is 5. You do a little Pythagorean theorem and find out that the horizontal leg is a 4. So if this is theta, and now they want the tangent ratio for theta, tangent we know is y over x, which is 3 over 4. That was an easy question. Especially easy once we draw it, because, like, you're dyslexic teacher doesn't really do so hot with formulas unless she draws them out. Let me show you something though. Same question. What if we, ter we were to use an identity? So the identity that I'm thinking about is the Pythagorean identity, which says cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Now, with the clues that you have, they told you that the sine ratio is 3 over 5. So instead of sine here, I could put in the ratio of 3 over 5, and I could square it. So 3 over 5 squared is 9 over 25. Algebra instincts kick in. What would you do next? Wouldn't you subtract the 9 over 25 over? Okay, fifth grade instincts kick in. What's 1 minus 9 over 25? 25 over 25 minus 9 over 25 is 16 over 25. Okay, kick back in algebra instincts. What would you do next? Technically, you would square root both sides of this equation, wouldn't you? Now, algebra says when you square root, 
an equation like this. The answer is both positive and negative. So how do I know if I want positive four-fifths or negative four-fifths? Which one? It goes back to the very beginning of this problem that said theta was between 0 and 90, therefore cosine must be positive. So not that one. This is the one they wanted. Well, that was fun. Is that what they wanted? No. They wanted sine. Or no, what do they want? Tangent. Tangent, excuse me. So now I have to go and use another identity that says tangent is sine divided by cosine. So 3 fifths divided by 4 fifths would give you your 3 fourths. Tell me, which problem method was easier? The drawing was a lot easier, yeah. But I need to show you the identity approach because it does come up in the future, especially in calculus. Um, you have a couple homework problems that are like this, and it is up to you how you approach them. I might suggest drawing the triangle. Plus, let's be honest, I think some of you could revisit that concept in general because I think we needed to revisit that concept for the last couple tests. All right. Um, however, I don't think you need to draw a triangle for every question. And this is where some of us get into trouble on like an SAT test because you guys are very wonderful students, both as humans and also just as math ability. But I think sometimes you guys get caught up on like, how does my teacher want me to do this question? <laughs> like, I don't care. Like when you're on your SAT test, I just want you to get it right. And the only thing I don't want to see is you looking at your neighbor. So if you can come up with a much easier way to do it that doesn't involve all the steps that you were having to do in, in class, I'm proud of you for that approach. Like here, guys. The cotangent is 12 over 5. What's tangent? 5 over 12. Yeah. Do I need to draw a triangle for that? No. These are just reciprocal identities. You have to know the relationship. You can draw it, but you're going to waste your time if you do. All right. I'm going to move along if you don't mind. We're probably going to approach all those questions old school where you're going to draw the triangle in the appropriate quadrant. Please, please, please. All right. A few things we got to talk about. This is not on your notes, but it is in your textbook. It's asking you about the even and oddness of trig functions. So this is a little confusing because they, they're flipping between cosine and sine and x and y as far as coordinates go. But they want you to investigate what happens when you uh, look at a positive angle versus a negative angle. So like if you travel positive 30 degrees versus going negative 30 degrees, how does that affect the outcome? Well, think about this like a coordinate plane, guys. We know this is the ordered pair x, y. This would be a almost twin of that ordered pair, except what's the only difference? It's still over x units, but now it's down y units, so the y value is negative. So what this comes down to saying is something about even and odd. Okay. Last semester, when I asked you about even functions, there was an algebraic test that said if you plug in a negative x value, and you get back the original function, that means you have an even function. Does anyone remember what kind of symmetry even functions had when you graphed them? No, Mrs. Bruzo, because that was like October. They have symmetry of the y-axis. Which trig function, cosine or sine, has symmetry of the y-axis? Cosine. Now, let's talk about that. What that means for trig is that if you were to plug in, so let's talk about trig, if you were to plug in a negative angle into a cosine function, you're just going to get back the same function again. So that goes back to this triangle here. It's x and it's x on either triangle because it's still moving just as far horizontally. Okay. So algebraically, cosine is your even function. Let's talk about odd. In algebra last semester, when you tested for odd, what happened is if you put a negative x into the function, you got the opposite function out. So for trig, if you plug in a negative angle, or you evaluate at a negative angle, you're going to get the opposite function back out. Well, isn't that exactly what happened with the y values here? You got positive y when you went positively, and then negative y when you went negatively. 
let's talk about the graphing symmetry. What kind of symmetry do you have if you're an odd function? Symmetry of the origin. So origin is odd. Which trig function has symmetry of the origin? There's actually two. Apparently it's sine and tangent. Very good. Tangent. Everybody forgets about tangent. So sine and tangent are odd. That is on your formula sheet somewhere, right in the middle. It says odd relations and even relations. We're gonna, that's going to become really, really important on an upcoming um, lesson about some theorems and other identities we're not going to talk about today. Um, I do want to show you this next part, and then we'll move on to the good stuff. Co-functions. So this really frustrated me when I first learned about trig functions in geometry and then Algebra 2 was, like, you could tell from their names that they had something to do with each other. Like sine and cosine, you're like, and then you learn about reciprocal functions, and you're like, wait, none of this goes together in my brain. I can't figure out how this kind of sorts through. So sine and cosecant are reciprocal functions to each other, but sine and cosine are what we call co-functions to each other. It all comes back down to this picture here, guys. You have a right triangle. Talk to me about the relationship between these two remote angles that are not the 90 degree angle. What do you know is always true about these two angles? They have to add up to what? They have to add up to 90. So they are, the word is complementary. Complementary. So that's the cofunction theorem. Here it is. It says that if you have the sine of one of the remote angles, it is the same as the cosine of his complement. So on a right triangle, that makes lots and lots of sense. Because look what happens here, guys. If this is your original angle, the sine is y over r. And if you move over to this angle instead, his complement, his cosine is y over r. So they have a very definite relationship to each other in the right triangle world. The problem is we don't usually look at right triangles for these trig problems. We're going to be looking at equations and things. So when we get to the sum and difference identities, this is going to become really critical. We're actually not going to look at that today, luckily. However, I want to show you one thing because this little algebra technique might help you out in some stuff that's coming up today. These co-function theorems, they, first of all, they go in radians instead of degrees. So they go pi over 2 minus theta. That's how they represent the, the complement angle. And it has to go in that order. Um, so look at this question here. They're telling you cotangent of theta minus pi over 2, which kind of feels like one of these, but it seems backwards. So there's a trick in math. When you have a factor that seems backwards, a subtraction problem that seems backwards, do you remember how you can turn it around? You have to factor something out. You can factor out a negative 1. So that's what they did right here. They factored out a negative 1, which changes everybody's sign. So this becomes a negative theta, and this becomes a positive pi over 2. No human would write that that way, though. So then they change the order, and they call it um, pi over 2 minus theta. But remember, you factored that negative out, right? So it's sitting out in front here. And then because cotangent is what? Even or odd? Odd. So odd functions, when you have a negative inside of the odd function, you can rewrite that as negative of the function, the opposite of the function. That is a nasty little trick that we're going to have to discover again in a... Uh, probably next week's lesson. We're not going to talk about it this week anymore. However, the act of you factoring out a negative 1, that is something that like you've probably seen in algebra before, and you might need to use it today. All right, skip that for now. Here we go. This was the slide I was trying to find, this guy right here. <laughs> so some suggestions, which this will be in your um, PDF of your slides, so you don't necessarily need to write these down. This is your tool belt for today, guys, and it really is just your instinct for algebra. Like you're looking at a question, you're like, what can I do? So the most obvious thing that we look at for trig trading is if things are not written in terms of sines and cosines, maybe that's a good place to start. Not always, but sometimes. We're going to be using identities to trade out. We're going to use basic algebra skills like canceling. And then we're going to use some, I'm going to call them basic skills, but things that trip kids up a little bit. 
When you have fractions separated, usually that's not good. And how do you bring fractions together? How do you add two fractions together? By getting common denominators. So that'll be fun. And then, because why not, I'm going to tell you that you can actually factor trigonometric expressions. So that'll be a hoot. And then, we're just going to need to go back to fifth grade for a lot of our lesson today. So, here we go. Um, these are, like I said earlier, they're a little challenging because kids get through the question and they're like, well, I don't know if I'm done. Well, for your homework, how do you know you're done? Because you open up the answer key and you go, cool, I'm done. Now, you should not have just answers, guys. This is going to be a challenge for some of you because you're like, well, it's very obvious. Like, I traded in my head. Guys, I'm giving you the answers. You can't just say, here's the answer. These, you have to show me trades. And, you know, overkill is better than underkill here. If you show me a step that you think is really stupid to show, you're probably in a good place. You need to show me that trade. I need to see it. That's going to become really critical tomorrow when we verify identities. I like identities better because they have a target, like you're supposed to get to this one point, and your job is to get there. But then I have a challenge with kids who say, oh, well, I traded. I'm like, well, you didn't show the trade. Like, you have to show the trade. So let's get through it today, guys. Let's talk. Okay, colored pens. This is the time to use them. Woo, fun. All right, let's start trading some things out. I want sines and cosines only. Let's start. Give me a better name, or a different name at least, for cosecant of x, written in terms of sines or cosines. 1 over sine. So, bad habit of mine is I literally write down 1 over sine, but I know I'm supposed to write down 1 over sine of x. Okay, talk to me about multiplying it by cotangent squared. Now, I know cotangent squared has a few different trades, but think about the most basic one that uses sines and cosines as a ratio. Cotangent is cosine over sine, so cotangent squared is cosine squared over sine squared. And then, technically speaking, I could trade 1 over sine out, but I'm kind of looking at this question going, okay, I'm going to have some common denominator fun in a minute. I'm going to leave it as 1 over sine. So this is always a great technique if you're stuck. Trade everything for sines and cosines if you're stuck. Now I need my fifth grade brain to take over. What are we really looking at here, guys? Now, this first multiplication section here. Fingers crossed that things cancel, like cross cancel. Turns out nothing cross cancels in this question. It would have to cross from the numerator and denominator. What do you truly have if you would write this as simple as possible? Cosine squared over sine to the third, yeah. So you have cosine squared over sine to the third. Hmm. Fun times. So to write down some words on my notes, all you did here was simplify is the general term. If you want to go really little kid, you can say smush. That's the word they used to tell you when you were little. Smush them together. All right, fifth grade style. I'm trying to add two things together. They're currently fractions. It would be simple if you could add them together, but how do you add fractions together? You get common denominators. So, this is, I think, where some kids forget what their purpose is. The whole point in getting a common denominator is to write it with one denominator. Like, you don't want to keep them separated, guys. So, what is going to be your common denominator on this next part of the problem? Good. Sine to the third. How are you going to get that? This first fraction already has it. What do you have to multiply this fraction by to get sine to the third in the denominator? Sine squared. Very good. And this is where some of you are like, I know the answer! I don't care. You still need to show me like two more steps. What do you got going on in the numerator here, guys? Cosine squared plus sine squared. Very good. Well, that's fantastic, but we're not done. <laughs> because this is my friend. Cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. That is that Pythagorean theorem that says cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. I know you can rearrange it a little bit, but this is equivalent to 1. 
And if this was a problem in the textbook, and this was your final answer, and you go to look at the key, it's not what the key would say. Anyone want to take a venture what the key would say? Cosecant to the third. Very good. We don't usually see to the third power. That's kind of weird, huh? Fun. That was a neat problem. Fun. So we traded. We smushed and simplified. We got common denominators. We traded again. We simplified again. So it's not like a step one, step two, step three thing, guys. It's, these are continual steps that you just keep going back to that tool belt, trying to see what else you can do. Okay. Instincts, kick in. I want your Algebra 1, 8th grade, ninth grade instincts. Quit. quit. You didn't quit. You didn't get to pre-cal quitting, man. What do you feel like you should do to this expression for no reason other than I just feel like it? Distribute. Thank you. We're going to distribute. Now, I wouldn't mind if while you're distributing this cosine function that you also trade. And by trade, I mean things that are not sines and cosines. So cosine is going to stay as cosine. However, I'm going to write it as cosine over 1 if you don't mind. But instead of multiplying it by tangent, can you trade tangent out for something? Sine over cosine. Thank you. Plus, now remember, you distributed cosine function into here, so you have another cosine function over 1. Uh, would you mind trading cotangent out for me? Cosine over sine. Thank you. So we kind of did two steps in one, but I'm okay with that. We distributed and we traded. Great. I need you to go little kid with me. Here we go. This blob right here. Ah, the cosines cancel. Now, we're going to find out in an upcoming problem that sometimes canceling is not the route you want to go. This problem it is. All right, so the cosines do cancel, and you have just sine. All right, what about this blob? Yeah, nothing cancels, so I'm going to write it as simple as possible, which would be cosine squared over sine. All right. You do technically have a fraction plus a fraction. How y'all add fractions together? Common denominators. All right, what is going to be your common denominator? Sine x. Good news. This guy has it. This guy just needs to be multiplied by a sine. So remember the whole point of this, guys. The reason you want common denominators is so that you can write them with the common denominator. So sine x is your denominator, but what's going on in this numerator? Sine squared. I know some of you are like, I know the answer. You got steps, okay? <laughs> sine squared plus cosine squared. And I know some of you are still like, I know the answer. Two more, one step in the answer. That's what I need from you. Ready? Give me a better name, a trade, if you will, for sine squared plus cosine squared. That is equivalent to one. I don't really like this answer, though. This is not the answer you would find in the key. It's cosecant. Very good. If you're wondering, are you done, besides the fact that you can look at the key, here's how I always thought about it. Like, the whole point of this is to simplify. So if I was to show this piece of paper to somebody who, who knows nothing about trig, parents, so me, <laughs> no, uh, and I asked them to identify where in the work do you see the simplest answer like, they're going to save that one, because no one likes fractions, and no one likes to add fractions, and no one likes to distribute things. So the simplest one is your final answer, okay? It is up for a little bit of debate on some questions. You might say, like, well, I feel like this is simpler than that one. Uh, I tend to give you really basic ones, though, so uh, on your homework, just check the key. If you're on the test and you're really stressed about it, just say, can I stop? And I will tell you yes or no, okay? Uh, ooh. Funsies. Yeah, this, okay. This is actually the last question I was able to do in first hour. So I'm kind of hoping we can do one more. Here's what's going to happen. Number nine is going to take you all the way down the side of your workspace. Like, start traveling to the right and then down the page along the margin. It's going to take a lot of room on this one, okay? Here we go. Well, good news, bad news. 
it already is written as one fraction. So you don't have to worry about common denominators in this question, at least not right now. I think we could trade some things out, though. Talk to me. Actually, time out. Don't trade yet. Focus right here. Sign times secant. So I'm not going to do anything with tangent. But sine times secant is sine times 1 over cosine. So anyone see why I didn't bother trading anything else out yet? What's sine over cosine? That's just tangent. Alright, I need you to go little kid with me. Tangent plus tangent. Two tangent. Yes, a lot of kids tell me it's tangent squared, but it's two tangent. So this numerator is 2 tangent x. All right, guys, I think we're almost home free. Do you see some cancellation? A tangent function cancels another tangent function. Oh, I lied. This is not the problem that has a lot. It's number 9 is the one that I was thinking of. I did. Oh, so I said 9, did 7, really messed with you. Okay, sorry. Well, good news. We're almost done. All right, 2 over cosecant. And I bet you think you're done. Because that looks pretty simple, right? Yeah, it turns out most people don't like to look at that. Because what's cosecant really? It's really 1 over sine. So if you take 2 and you divide it by 1 over sine, what you're really doing is taking 2 and you're multiplying it by sine. People, this is just 2 sine. Which, let's agree, that's simpler than the fraction. So. Okay, sorry. I lied. Number nine is the super fun one. That's the last one I got to. We're going to do eight, we're going to do nine, and then we're probably going to have to pack up for the day. So um, I'll post this lesson. I'll also post my old lesson from last year where I think I got through more examples. And you decide if you need to go back and watch something, okay? All right, number eight. Let me look at the space on number eight. Oh, number eight's easy. I do have a trade, but it's one we haven't used this looks promising. Anytime you have an addition or subtraction problem that involves a 1 and then one of the functions squared, it makes me think about the Pythagorean trade. Can you tell me what you can trade 1 plus tangent squared for? I heard three different things. Secant squared. Okay, this is secant squared. So you have cosecant squared divided by secant squared. And you're looking at that going like, oh, that has to be something. And it is. And off the top of my head, I'm not really sure what, because I'm dyslexic. So I'm going to need to write this in its sine and cosine versions. Cosecant squared is 1 over sine squared. And then we're trying to divide it by secant squared, which is 1 over cosine squared. But I need you to go fifth grade with me. How do you divide fractions? You flip the second one, reciprocal, right? So this is really 1 over sine squared times cosine squared. Ladies and gentlemen, you have cosine squared over sine squared. You have cotangent squared. Cool. Fun. Let's try number nine. This, this is the one. This is the one that's going to take you down the margin. Um, there's a question... I really want to do number 11 tomorrow. So if you could try, I probably won't do anything else on the page besides number 11 tomorrow. Try not to steal so much space from number 11, or at least, like, leave space to the left of number 11, I guess. All right, number 9. Algebra, kick in. What do you think? Distribute, very good. Little kids will call it foiling, but yeah, distri yeah distribution, very good. So we're going to distribute. And because we're just simplifying, if you want to kind of do this in two steps at one time, that's fine. But you have secant times cosecant. And then secant times 1. And then you have a subtraction sign with a tangent times a cosecant. It's going to be a hoot. All right, and then negative tangent times 1 is minus tangent. All right, here's what's going on. You need to check out all of these terms 
on their own. Some of them need some automatic trades and some canceling, and then some of them are just trades. Seek it, which is one over cosine. Cosecant is one over sine. All right. I don't know if it's good news or bad news, but nothing cancels, so let's move on. Secant is 1 over cosine. Put down a subtraction sign after that. All right, trade tangent for me. Sine over cosine. And then cosecant is 1 over sine. Now, automatic reflex. You're like, oh, the signs cancel. Wait, we got to stop and look before we do some canceling. And then tangent is minus sine over cosine. Guys, you have a massive fifth grade fraction problem. You've got fraction plus fraction minus fraction minus fraction. None of the fractions cancel each other out. Like the entire fraction does not cancel the other entire fraction. And I know your instinct is across these signs out, but I think that would be counterproductive because if I'm going to try to join up all these fractions, I'm going to need common denominators. Nothing cancels over here, which means your common denominator has to be both cosine and sine. So rather than canceling out that sine function in this red part, I'm just going to leave it. All right, help me build up my common denominator. This fraction is good to go. This fraction needs the sine. This fraction is good to go. This fraction needs the sine. So now I get to step back and figure out what exactly is in our numerator. And it's all this. Woo. Okay, 1 times 1. I got that. That's 1. Plus sine minus sine minus sine squared. All right, I need a little kid fun. You see anything in the numerator that'll simplify? Sine and minus sine cancel, so you are left with something up there. What do you have? 1 minus sine squared. That feels like a rearrangement of our Pythagorean one. Can you think about a way that you could rearrange that first Pythagorean identity and trade it out? I heard it's cosine squared. Yep, this would be equivalent to cosine squared if you rearrange that equation. So you have cosine squared over cosine times sine. Now this is where kids let their little kid math fail them, guys. Cosine squared literally means a cosine times another cosine. So tell me what's going to happen here. One of the cosine functions is going to cancel, and you have, yes, it is cotangent. Cosine over sine is cotangent. Boom. Told you, all the way down the margin. Fun times. Okay, so we're going to stop that lesson there. Um, I'll post, I'll check my other lesson out and see if it goes further into examples. You guys are going to work on your homework. It is like nine questions, guys. You can, you can do this. And the first couple are those triangle questions that are old. Um, check the key. You can even write down the answers before you start so you know where you're going to end. Your job is to get all of the work in between it. I need to see work on every one of these. This is not a I did it in my head moment.